Hello and welcome back to The Note. We have some drama. Overnight, literally at midnight, the Turkish Central Bank announced that it was going to double some of its base lending rates in a very aggressive and dramatic attempt to draw the line under the selling of emerging market currencies that we've seen in recent weeks, particularly in Turkey. Now, is this a symptom of something broader and is it going to work? With me now to attempt to answer some of these questions is a very popular guest with some FT readers, the author of Anatomy of the Bear, Russell Napier. Russell, thanks for joining me once more. Let's very quickly take a look at uh, what has happened in Turkey. Uh, the blue line shows you their one-week uh, repo rate and the uh, red line shows you the steady deterioration of the, the lira before uh, the most recent news. Do you think this is going to work? Have we got any historical parallels for whether a move this drastic is actually going to be effective? Uh, usually I have long answers. The answer is no. Uh, okay. let, me, let me give you the historical <laughs> yes. uh, reasons why the answer is no. So there are two reasons why this uh, is likely to fail. One is politics and the second is the impact on the financial system. So one historical example of politics is obviously uh, the United Kingdom 1992 and Norman Lamont. We had rates moving from 10% to 15% in a day and effectively it's a political decision at the end of that day that the government and the economy could not uh, accept and live with base rates of 15%. And markets had already worked that out as well and bet against it. The whole market yeah. system knew. I mean, I personally was a fund manager and was selling sterling that day and I was very late in selling it, but it, you know, at a certain rate of interest rates we realised the domestic economy couldn't cope with that. Uh, we realised that polit politicians couldn't cope with it and we sold. So that's example number one mm. of why this is unlikely to happen. There is another one which is ultimately uh, more damaging and I think that would take us to Thailand. 1996 to the 1st of July 97. So they did the value on the 1st of July 97, but in the period before that, they very much attempted this approach to sustain the Thai baht against the United States dollar. Now in that one year period, they effectively bankrupted the entire financial system right. by keeping interest rates at this level. So if you have a leveraged financial system, and let's face it, every modern financial system is basically leveraged, this is a rate which, ha which is basically causing you internal deflation. So to defend your exchange rate, you have to basically deflate and become more competitive. Very, very, very few countries can do that. The two that spring to mind for me are Hong Kong and Latvia, right. <laughs> and this is not Hong Kong or Latvia. Okay, so we certainly have to have very great caution about whether this incident is any, in any way over. Now let's take a look at the broader causes of why this is happening, which by your account probably lie in the global forces of deflation. This is a chart of a variation of this chart we've looked at various times. The Fed has drastically increased its balance sheet and inflation has continued to fall. What's going on here? Well, I think anybody who looked at that objectively and ignored the publicity might say that quantitative easing doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, is it creating the inflation? And it was very easy to say through the first half of this that it would ultimately lead to inflation. Well, we're coming up to the fifth anniversary of quantitative easing and no sign of inflation. Now, I'll give you two reasons why I think it hasn't created inflation. First of all, this is a chart of uh, the asset side of the bank's balance sheet. Uh, is effectively creating bank reserves. But those bank reserves remain, don't remain dormant even in the United States of America. Uh, bank credit in America is basically flat from last May. Ever since Treasury yields went up, there's been no bank credit growth, therefore there's no money growth. And without money growth, and that would be broad money, how are we going to get inflation? Right. So that's number one. But the second one, and the one we've just been talking about, is the emerging markets. They're slowing rapidly. Uh, I think we all know that if you double interest rates, your economy is probably going to slow a little bit. Right. Uh, that, slow, that slowdown is affecting the whole emerging market complex. And that's where this inflation came from post-2009. The reason it's been coming down since 2011 is EM's been slowing since 2011. And I think in 14, it slows dramatically. So effectively, they are exporting deflation to the central economies of the West on your on your argument. Well, there's two ways of looking at it. If they defend the exchange rate successfully, then they're growing more slowly themselves. Therefore, that has an eff effect on global inflation. Their demand for commodities, for instance, would be less. Or they devalue and then they export the deflation. Uh, Japan is in the same situation. Uh, this is where the emerging markets are. They're either going to deflate and grow more slowly, reducing mm -hmm. global growth, or they're going to devalue and export the deflation. Okay, now let's take a look at what the, uh, set the emerging markets have been doing. This is a look at uh, foreign exchange reserve growth since just before the crisis. Uh, there's quite a clear pattern here as well, isn't there? Take, take us through what's going on. Yeah, well, once quantitative easing starts, it basically forces capital into the emerging markets and they do not let their exchange rates go up. Mm. So the mechanism for doing that is to buy lots of treasuries and print lots of money. So you can see this as basically the printing of money in the domestic economy. And as you can see from this period onwards, it's really flattening out. Uh, even China, the rate of growth has come down significantly. Some of these are going flat. This is the money creation that defeated the deflation of 2009 and it is virtually stopped. Okay, so 
where do we go from here? You've uh, obviously been quite well known for your bearish predictions about where the US stock market could go. How does the, the, this situation play out over the next matter of months? Well, current equity valuations are based upon the fact that quantitative easing will work, that ultimately the central bankers come back with more QE and ultimately QE works. Uh, there's a long way down if people conclude that quantitative easing is not sufficient or is, is, is necessary but not sufficient to produce the levels of nominal GDP growth to get rid of our debt burdens. And I think as this year progresses, we begin to realise that that's exactly what quantitative easing is uh, necessary but not sufficient. And therefore, there's a big surprise for those who think the Fed has got their back. OK. Russell, thank you very much, as always. I know a lot of people out there agree with Russell and a lot of others disagree. As ever, it's very interesting. And as ever, I think it would be very dangerous to ignore this guidance. There is, uh, this is still a very dangerous situation for the world capital markets.